afternoon, folks, and, uh, and welcome. I want to thank all of you for coming today. These are exciting times uh, for the University of Missouri School of Law. Uh, despite the challenges that legal education faces and the demands for increasing skills training opportunities, uh, we at the University of Missouri have a number of significant skills offerings and clinical offerings. And today I have the pleasure of announcing the opening of a new clinic at the university focusing on veterans' benefits. This is a, uh, a tremendous piece of news that uh, I'm, I'm very happy to share with you today. This new clinic will offer additional opportunities for live client contact for our law students, uh, enabling them to develop skills in interviewing, counseling, uh, developing the medical records and other evidence necessary to establish a claim uh, for benefits for veterans and their families. It also will serve uh, a good public service for those who have served this country in various wars uh, and to family members who have served in their own way in supporting uh, those activities. Now a clinic like this doesn't start without people. And a number of the people who played a role in this clinic are up here today. And I want to particularly mention several of them. Uh, first off, Angela Drake. Angela is a product of GI Bill. Her father, Army Major Joe Green, was in the Vietnam War, was killed in 1970. He was known for his dedication and devotion to duty. And Professor Drake remembers him as a real-life G.I. Joe, as someone who enabled her to become a junior jumper at Fort Benning, Georgia, at the very jump tower where he had trained for paratrooper training. Angela is a, uh, an experienced civil litigator. She practiced with a firm in Kansas City and then in Springfield. Uh, and has been teaching courses for us in the areas of trial practice, insurance, and pretrial. She will serve as the director of the clinic, and you will be hearing from her in a few minutes. But I want to acknowledge Angela right now, if you don't mind standing for a minute. Why don't you? You know, the clinic is a great concept, but it's Angela who did the hard work of putting into place uh, the things that were necessary to make this real. Uh, and I'm very grateful to her for the work that she did uh, in, in creating it and making it happen. And, and is certainly one of the reasons we are here today. Secondly, a clinic can't really exist without student support. And I want to particularly acknowledge two law students who I met with last year, probably around this time. Uh, one of them is up here and the other one's uh, in the audience. Larry Lambert and Scott Apking uh, were two law students involved in the uh, Veteran Society here at the law school. And they expressed the interest and support that students might have in the establishment of a clinic. So I'd ask the two of them, Larry and Scott, if you'd stand. Another person who played a role in this uh, is someone who often plays a role in, in things going on at the law school. I sometimes tease him and I say, Bob Bailey, what do you do? <laughs> I never quite know what Bob does, but uh, but I do actually, and, and Bob uh, is a tremendous part of this clinic. He helped get the people together to make it happen. He helped us in getting the funding for the new clinic, and he helped build student support. So much student support that this clinic is already oversubscribed. We have more students uh, than uh, we have places in the clinic, which is, of course, a good problem to have. Uh, and Bob himself is a veteran, and uh, I want to thank Bob. Please stand for a minute. Another person I want to 
thank is uh, someone who's not here today. His name is Danny Bogart. Uh, and uh, Les Wilson Fryer Booth is here, and let's see Wilson. I don't think anyone else. Uh, Lisa, you know Danny. Lisa well, Key knows yeah. Danny Bogart. Well, Danny. His, his reputation uh, precedes him. Danny is a law school classmate of mine uh, from many years ago and a, and a longtime friend. You might wonder, what does he have to do with the Veterans Clinic? Well, when, when I was a dean candidate about two years ago, and I was talking to Danny, he's associate dean at Chapman Law School in Southern California, and I said, you know, we really need more skills training. And, uh, and I'm trying to figure out ways in which Missouri might have additional skills training. He said, why don't you think about a veterans clinic? And I thought, that's a great idea. Chapman has one, and it's been very successful. And my thought was that this would be an appropriate opportunity for our students here at Missouri uh, and it's uh, certainly something that would serve veterans uh, in, in the city, in the region, in the state, uh, and it seemed like a great idea to me. And so combined with the support that the students have had, uh, we now can stand here today and sit and enjoy the fact that this clinic has come to fruition. So I want to thank my friend Danny for, uh, for his role in it. And then uh, lastly, nothing can really happen without funding. You need people and funding to make things happen. And I want to thank those who have given financial support to this clinic. Uh, people who've given that support are not seeking uh, recognition, but I particularly do want to thank the Hulston Family Foundation for its support, as well as others who uh, played a role in that funding. And so, uh, once again, I'm very pleased to, uh, to make this announcement. And I'm going to turn the podium over now to Scott, who will uh, continue the program and uh, talk about student interests. Thank you. It's really great to see everybody today. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how this clinic came about, how the students got involved in the clinic. And really, it's been um, you know, a community effort ever since we even had any idea about veterans law. Um, there has been so much support, it's been overwhelming as evidence here today. Um, so back in November 2011, when we were 1L law students and really had no idea what was going on and we're really scared that uh, final exams were coming up, four of us got together on the top of the law school library stairs and we decided, hey, we should start this group um, about veterans. <laughs> we thought, you know, we were all veterans, this would help, um, you know, the interests of veterans in our communities and we also wanted to become great attorneys. So, you know, just four of us hanging out, talking, brought this idea up. Um, immediately, we got to work. We went to the VA hospital, to the Veterans Justice Outreach Program, um, and we asked them how we could help give legal aid. Uh, and in the back of our mind was, we need to have a clinic here at the university. Uh, we also started trying to research veteran service organizations to see how we could get involved. Um, but we really still didn't know what veterans law was. So in the summer of 2012, we thought, you know, we really need to invite someone here who knows what they're talking about, who knows what veterans law is, get people interested and let them know that they don't need to be a veteran um, to be in the society. So we invited the president of the Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims Bar Association to speak. Uh, he agreed, and in October 2012, he came out. And like I said, this is a community effort. Out of nowhere, um, Dean Meyer says, hey, would you guys like to go to lunch with us? Of course, we'd like to go to lunch. We're law school, but we don't have any money. That would be fantastic. Um, Dean Bailey joined us, and our speaker, Mr. Ridgway, joined us, and he um, related to us how much this benefits students and how this relates to things you'll do in your everyday kind of practice, like rules of evidence, like procedure, oral arguments, writing briefs. Um, we left for lunch. Dean Bailey and Dean Meyer left for lunch, energized you know, ready to attack it and really start a clinic. The students um, went on and we went about the business of becoming better attorneys. So in November 2012, we went to the National Veterans Move Court competition so we could compete against schools like Georgetown, Stetson, George Washington, and really discover where Mizzou was in the advocacy world. Um, while we were doing that, D. Meyer and D. Bailey have been working on the clinic tirelessly. Um, we've invited the Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims to come and hear oral arguments in this very courtroom. 
which they will do in March. And it, you know, basically everyone in the community has given us so much support and this has happened so quickly. When we were standing on the stairs uh, talking about our interest in veterans law, when we were 1Ls, we could have never thought that we'd have the opportunity to join this clinic in our third year um, right before we graduate. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone for coming today. Um, if you're interested in our the Missouri Veterans Law Society, we have over 30 members now. Most of those people are non-veterans, all right? And we're just interested in becoming attorneys uh, that are good at, at advocacy and helping out veterans. So I invite you to listen today. Uh, if you think this is going to enhance your education, if this is something that you think is a quality program, please approach us afterwards and help us keep this uh, an excellent program as we afford. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Um, I'm just so excited and so humbled. As my students know, I usually don't get nervous, and I'm actually nervous right now. Um, but I'm more humbled by deans with visions. And there were two very important ones in my life that bring us here today. I'm humbled, humbled by how smart our students are at the University of Missouri. I mean, in insurance law, they're incredible. In trial practice, they're incredible. And it's not just in class. They go outside of class, like Scott and Larry did, and they do this other incredible stuff, which brings us here today. I'm humbled by the generosity of the Halston family. We stand in an extraordinary building. We have wonderful technology. We have a great environment in which to teach our students. And that is going to be so important to the Veterans Point. I'm humbled by the faculty here at MU that has been so kind and warm to me and has grabbed my hand as I go astray <laughs> and led me back and said, here is how you need to do a clinic. There's no way I could do it without the faculty that's been here and will continue to be here, and I just so very much appreciate that. But first, let me ask if anybody in the room has served in the military, or if you have a family member who served in the military, please stand. Please stand if you can. We need, we need to thank you. Thank you all. That's why we're here, okay? That's why we're doing a veterans training. My dad was a paratrooper. He jumped out of airplanes. He chose to jump out of airplanes. He practiced jumping out of airplanes. When he jumped out of airplanes, he landed. His ankles felt it, his knees felt it, his lower back felt it. Had he survived the Vietnam War, which sadly he didn't, he probably would have had back problems. Many, many of our paratroopers suffer from leg injuries and lower back problems. Our government tells our troops, go fight the war. Don't worry. We're going to give you benefits. What the Veterans Clinic is going to do is help veterans like my dad, like the people who stood up, stood up make sure that you get the benefits you were promised. We are learning from studies that over a half a million of our Afghanistan and Iraq troops are going to come back with post-traumatic stress disorder. That is a difficult thing to diagnose. It's a difficult thing to reach back and get service connected. It's a long and arduous process for that veteran to go through. It takes years, I'm not kidding, years, years for VA to decide on when VA decides a claim, they are wrong 60% of the time. They're wrong over half the time. Fortunately, there are appellate processes that veterans can go through. When lawyers help veterans through the appellate process, they have an 80% success rate. That's, a, that's inspiring. That's exciting. We can do that. It's my hope that for every student who goes through the clinic, they will continue to help veterans in their private practice. If each student, we're going to have six in the spring, goes out and graduates, 
helps two veterans a year. In 10 years, our clinic with those first six will have served 120 veterans. That will begin to make a dent in the process. And it will grow exponentially as the clinic continues. <coughs> so students, I know you are out there. How do you sign up? As Dean Meyer suggested, the good news is there's more of you who want to take the clinic than spots which are available. So the clinic is going to be run like a law firm. When you want a job at a law firm, you've got to come apply and you've got to interview. And that's how you're going to register. You're going to give me your resume and you're going to set a time to come have an interview at the law firm. And we're going to go through the interview process. Then we will post names. We'll be doing inter interviews every Tuesday and Wednesday afternoon through the month of October. God willing, and I don't have any reason to believe it's not going to happen, the clinic is going to continue beyond the spring semester and into the future. So if you miss it in the spring, come back and we'll get you in again. But that will be the process. Three credit hours. We're going to meet at our mutually convenient time, just like a law firm. And a law firm, partners and associates get together during the week. They talk about the cases they have. They talk about the law that they're going to need to apply, and then they meet individually. That is how our clinic is going to operate. So we will not have regular class sessions. We're going to have meetings as we do in a law firm. So I urge all of you to come visit with me and help make the Veterans Clinic as good as it can be. And I think it's going to be really, really good. So with that, I'm going to introduce Chris Dunn, one of our students. Well, the good news is I finally got an interview. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was in 1968, um, a young uh, David Myers uh, was in, living in a much different world than it is today. Um, the war was raging in Vietnam, and if you were a smart young person in that day, so if you were a smart young man, you uh, went to college. And uh, Mr. Myers went to college at Murray State, or Murray College in Jacksonville. And after graduating, uh, the war in Vietnam was still going on. And like a lot of young people did that day, if you had uh, family members that had served in the service, you typically tried to choose your own destiny because the draft was going on and um, sort of better the devil you knew than the devil you didn't know. And um, um, Mr. Myers decided to go down and enlist in the United States Navy. And uh, he was thinking, you know, two years in, I'll fulfill my obligation, you know, drink a lot of coffee offshore. And, uh, a lot of and beer in short. A lot of beer in short, <laughs> visit some nice places, and uh, go home. But um, he didn't do that. He uh, did three years as an enlisted man, and then um, later on um, decided that. Uh, his interest in the law hadn't faded from when he was an undergraduate and uh, went on to uh, attend law school and become commissioned as a JAG officer. Uh, Mr. Myers did 28 years of service in the, in the United States Navy total. And as anyone who's ever been in the, the military knows, um, you're continually thrown from one job to another job. And oftentimes, the day you arrive, you are not qualified to do the job that all of a sudden the national defense of the United States of America depends upon you performing your job correctly, and it's a lot of OJT. And uh, Mr. Meyer's career is uh, filled with a lot of steadily increasing responsibilities in the uh, Judge Advocate General's Court in the United States Navy. In 2012, um, excuse me, in uh, 2000, May of 2000, he retired and then uh, was offered a position uh, with the Veterans Consortium, their pro bono program, and his uh, job was uh, to select uh, cases and uh, evaluate them and assure that they got matched up with an appropriate attorney. Um, while Mr. Myers was in the service, he served on the USS uh, Ranger, uh, which was an aircraft carrier. It was a uh, fair, oh, excuse me, forestal class super carrier. And for those of you that are over 35, it was the carrier that was in uh, Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, <laughs> along with the Dolphins. So anyway, he served in uh, the Southeast Asian Theater, um, supporting the mission in Vietnam. And during 73, 74 was when things were starting to get sort of hairy 
it was after the Paris peace talks and as things were starting to widen down and there was quite a bit of um, uh, negotiations going on between the United States and North, uh, Vietnam. But anyway, since he started with the uh, Veterans Consortium, he's helped uh, hundreds if not thousands of veterans um, appeal their claims up to the uh, Veterans Court of Appeal. And uh, without a lot else, I will introduce Mr. David Myers, Commander David Myers. Chris, thank you so much for those kind words. And I want to thank Angela and Dean Myers for uh, having me here today. This is exciting stuff. It really is. Uh, we get that, we're out there in D.C. where nothing else is going on today. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we get to uh, uh, out to the field and, and help these things like, like the clinic get fired up and started. Uh, in, in naval terms, everyone who's involved with the clinic today is what we would call a plank owner. <coughs> Excuse me. Fortunately, Angela is not going to waste a good bottle of champagne cracking across the bow or the podium or something like that. But you're underway, you're, you're sailing into new waters, and I think you're going to find it to be a very exciting time. Now, I work for the pro bono program, and our job is to provide representation for veterans who have a valid case, one, one issue, uh, and are appealing it from the Board of Veterans' Appeals, which is part of the uh, VA, to the United States Court of Appeals for Veterans' Claims. Uh, this is a federal court, completely free and independent of the VA, and there's a lot of folks who don't know that. So there's your first thing you gotta teach, folks. Uh, you know the guy on the left? Carol Scott on the right is uh, my deputy, and she is one dynamic lady. She's 72 years young. She was, uh, I call her a flower child 40 years ago. We probably would have tried to strangle each other. Uh, but uh, nobody represents Carol, nobody represents veterans with more enthusiasm and energy than Carol Scott. She's the lady you'll be talking to when we start, get, get to the point where we can place a case with you folks, which won't be that far away. My heroes, now, first of all, that bird up there, it's probably, there's probably litigation there for the uh, copyright folks. But uh, well, we'll talk about my heroes. About eight, nine, when I was eight or nine years old, I fell in love with baseball. There's guys like Seaman Second Class, Stanley, Frank Usual, GM3, Lawrence Barra, who you know him as Yogi. Edith Slaughter, Marine Corps, Chief Petty Officer Bob Feller, Hank Bauer, who looked like a Marine Bulldog. Ralph Hopp was an Army engineer, an Army Ranger, my favorite all-time great left-hander, Warren Spahn. Combat engineer, had to overcome shrapnel injury in the foot that he kicked off on. And Ted Williams, a Marine Corps aviator, uh, flew 37 missions in Korea, wingman for John Glenn, who I'm sure was happy to um, have a wingman with 20 over 10 vision. <laughs> May have helped with the curveball too, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, but they were baseball players when I learned about them and they went on to have other lives. But the point that I want to bring to you is that these are men who had lives before, went to serve their country in a time of need and came back to that life. The people you will deal with, your clients, will be exactly the same. Except they won't have that fame, they won't have that experience to come back to. They'll have normal lives, you hope, and if they're not normal, then that's where you will step up and help them get the benefits that will help them get back to as close to normal as they can. So keep staying usual in mind is that. Somebody who went to serve his country, came back, did well, and try to kind of keep that theory in mind as you help some folks who uh, won't be making that kind of money, but are, will be great people doing great things. And by the way, just in passing, if you happen to have the opportunity to see uh, Wounded Warriors in action, softball team, basketball team, these kids with uh, artificial legs and arms, tremendous athletes who are doing so much uh, to overcome the injuries that they have, uh, have dealt with. 
numbers. I'm not going to spend much time here. 22 million veterans, 3 million plus, 3.5 million receiving compensation. There's 513,000 folks been diagnosed with PTSD. I suspect that will go up. Um, 920,000 receiving educational benefits. A couple of those folks are here. Clinics, outpatients, cemeteries. Here in Missouri, you got half a million vets, 30,000 left over from World War II. 12 years ago when I started doing this, we had, uh, the country had about 5,000 folks who had served in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. I think all those folks are, are gone now. But uh, Gulf of War 127, about 10% female. That number will go up too as women increasingly get opportunities to uh, serve their country and they are taking it with a passion and, and thank you for that. Here's the system. Veteran files a claim. We'll come back to the FTC in a second. It goes to the regional office and then it can bounce around a little bit. We call that the, uh, the hamster wheel. Appeals to the Board of Veterans Appeals. You use the Form 9 to get to the, the board. And then to the U.S. Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims, which is where you folks come in. Uh, if you are not successful, you can appeal to the United States Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. Angela has already said if they have a case where they are not successful, uh, which is unlikely to happen, of course, they're willing to go to the Fed Circuit, so stand by. Uh, Maybe we'll find one real tough one for you. Let the folks get uh, get their feet wet up to their knees. And if things go a little wrong, you can also go to the, to the Supreme Court of the United States. I'll talk about our recent victory in Henderson in a moment. FDC, a fully developed claim. Now, I have been talk, doing this for 12 years. About 10 years ago, I figured out that if you got all the evidence that the veteran already had, and gave it to the claims officer, you were at a, you were at a good, good thing to do. You were at an advantage. Guess what? The VA finally caught up with me. Uh, they have started a new program, fully developed claims, and you are supposed to help the veteran collect everything that he has. This is not just uh, uh, you know, some, some simple paperwork, but he should go to his doctor and get the paperwork. He should get those letters. Uh, that he sent home to mom and to the spouse, to the wife, and say, I'm talking about being injured. I'm talking about what I saw. And you put it all together, and hopefully that will speed things up and the right answer will be arrived at a whole lot quicker. Why do we have the pro bono program? Well, Veterans Judicial Review Act 1988 created the court. At the beginning, 80% of the appellants were pro se. Uh, Judge Frank Napiger has looked at the nature of the appeals that were coming to the court. He actually, apparently one actually came in written in crayon. The VA had lawyers from the get-go. This didn't seem like a fair fight. So off to Congress, Judge Nebaker went, and here we are. We have kind of stayed the same for probably too long. Then in 2012, we dropped down to 40% pro se rate at filing and we're going to be a little lower under that. Somebody told me once that if you're doing a, if you're not profit in a perfect world, you will end up going out of business. I don't think we're going to go out of business, but at least we've got 60% of the folks represented either by private practitioners or through our program when the claim is filed or shortly thereafter. The court. Uh, this is the case load. We've uh, got 28, 36 at the end of the end of September. That's about 3,700 for a year. So that case, part of the load staying the same. Got up to nine judges: uh, Chief Judge Castle, Judge Hagel, Judge Mormon, Lance Davis, and Peach are all veterans. Uh, Judge Sholin is a Army brat, or Navy brat. I'm sorry, grew up in a Navy family. It's all a lot of the world. Meg Bartley, outstanding uh, uh, legal. Uh, veterans Law Practitioner, and uh, uh, Judge Greenberg is actually his second term on a federal court. Eighty percent of our decision, the court's decisions, are judge alone without precedential value. But if you get one of those cases where you argue, you get a panel or on banc, exciting stuff. Keys to the system. 
If you're practicing, there's some things that you have to keep in mind. The first one, if that guy calls you up and says, I got a board decision and I want to appeal it, the first question that is asked is, when did you get the board decision? What is the mailing date on the board decision? And then you go, 120, when's, when's that date? And if he's somewhere around 119, you get it to the post office because the postmark rule applies. So if you get it postmarked with a little green card and an illegible uh, uh, postmark, You've saved the day, at least you've saved step one. Our uh, favorite case uh, was a case called Henderson. We went to the Supreme Court. The CAVC had decided based on a case called Bowles, which involved a uh, civil case, uh, a judge who couldn't count, a lawyer who was lazy. And the bottom line was if it was, it was the deadline jurisdictional. In Bowles it was. CAV said, well, we're going to apply bowls to this, so it's 120 days or nothing. Now, when you have a case that goes, is misfiled with a regional office, and they get it on day 90, and then forward it to the court on day 130, it doesn't seem fair. So anyway, we took that, we picked it up at the last minute. We actually had to ask for a, a stay before uh, the mandate uh, issued. Uh, to clear the uh, judgment issued. And away we went. A uh, firm in Colorado, Tom Stover's firm, gave us a, donated a million and a $1.1 million in, uh, in uh, donated time. And uh, the Supreme Court came back, eight nothing, saying, uh, no, the law, as it applies to veterans, the 120 day rule is an important rule, it is not jurisdictional equitable tolling must be applied. And by the way, Mr. Stover just won another uh, equitable tolling case yesterday for a guy who uh, uh, had a psychotic schizophrenic problem during the 120 day period. Earlier effective date, this is one of the rules that will drive you nuts. Because the effective, earlier effective date, we get a lot of cases like that. I want to talk about a guy named John B. McMurray. And John was an Iwo Jima Marine. Uh, but the rule is clear. You have, if you file within one year of your uh, uh, discharge date, the effective date of the claim, the day the money starts coming in, is the date of discharge. On day 366, the effective date is the date you file a claim. John waited about 45 years to file his claim. And I asked him, I said, John, and John was a good old boy tobacco farmer down in South Carolina. I said, John, what, why did you wait 45 years? He said, well, it didn't bother me much. Only when it rained. I said, this is not real, but that's what he said. Well, only when it rained. The VA gave him his 60%, which was the max possible, within a month, six weeks. or you know, It was very quickly turnaround. So clearly, and we went, we went to the mat. We went through his claim file page by page. And ultimately, we could not get 45 years of back pay for John because that was the law. Uh, but we tried. I mean, you have informal claims. We looked for that. We made some arguments. We went to the court actually twice and weren't successful. Um, but earlier effective dates, if you remember I started out the 120-day rule, if you do the 120-day thing, you don't have to worry about earlier effective dates to the same level. Uh, clear and unmistakable error, that means it was a really bad decision. A lot of vets will say, hey, it was clear and unmistakable error. Well, that means they didn't agree with it. Uh, any Cardinal fans here? <laughs> okay. 1985, play at first base. Ken Denkinger blows the call. That was clear and unmistakable error. That's my, that's my criteria. <laughs> But what it is is basically, it really had to be something horribly wrong. It's not a strong argument, but we'll go with it sometimes just to see what we, what we can do with it. The basic, oh, 1151, medical malpractice by the VA. Uh, they are treated the same as a service connection claim. And uh, that brings us to the next thing. Your basic and most fundamental rule in the VA practice is Service connection is the question. You need a current condition, which means you have to deal with modern medicine. In-service injury, 
What was the history of it? And the nexus, what's the connection between the two? Uh, let me skip to the next one. You need the big picture. The in-service time is the history of it. Um, if he's in Vietnam, and by the way, 37% of the backlog are <coughs> Vietnam cases. I saw some figures this morning. 37% of the backlog Vietnam cases. 23% uh, for Gulf War, 21% for uh, post 9-11 service. Uh, you got to educate, and that's one of the things as attorneys that you will have to do, you will have to educate the VA, that rating officer, okay? We've had cases, let me run a couple of examples by you. Uh, VA said, we're not going to approve this claim, he was a mechanic. Well, he had a picture of, of him standing in front of a burned out, shot up truck on Highway 1 in Vietnam, which was affectionately referred to as a highway to hell. And this guy's job was to go out and get the trucks and whatever back to some place to be repaired. He got shot at a lot. That's combat. Uh, we had a cook. They denied it because he's a cook. Cooks aren't in combat. Well, if you're stationed in an Air Force base in northern Vietnam during a period which Google says you were mortared 62 times during a the period of time that this guy was there, maybe he was in combat. Uh, my personal favorite, the uh, uh, guy who was taking 95 pound shells with a friend, throwing them in a breach of 155, a 155 artillery piece, and somebody had fired that downrange in support of Marine and Army units. VA said that's not combat. Well, maybe it was a tree removal service or something that we were doing at the time, but we went back, we placed that one, we placed all those, by the way, and I think we've prevailed in at least three of the other ones still out there. It's going to be a little tricky down the road with the Iraq and Afghan, because you're going to have the same sort of thing. What happened to this guy or this gal while they were there? It might not be a combat unit, but somebody may have been shooting at you. Uh, Talking about units, get your unit history. Get the guy to bring the history. Going back to the fully developed claim, get those letters. Interesting point about technology, people exchange emails now. For the World War II guys, the Vietnam guys, there's boxes of letters. Those are, those are hard, you can hold those. Do you save all the email? Because I think, I think for historians and for people with claims 20 years from now, the lack of emails, because I don't think we're saving them, is going to be a problem. How do you, how do you show that connection? You're not going to have a dear wife, I was shot at today. Because you send it by an email and somewhere along the line somebody goes to delete. It's going to be an interesting technological thing. The units, websites, company logs. If you're in a small unit, Army Reserve, keep track of your buddies, that sort of thing. Technology is going to save some things and make other things harder. Right now, the big one right now that there's going to be litigation on is the virtual claim file. The VA has set it up. It's up there in the cloud. You know, maybe that service record floats above my head all the time. And this makes it very convenient for the VA to exchange information between one doctor and another. Um, and that's a good thing. But then you get a board decision where they say, we are denying this claim based on review of the virtual file. In particular, a medical examination done on September 30th, 2013. Now I'm sitting there as a lawyer and I've gone through the claim file. And I don't see a medical examination that was done on September 30th of 2013. How do I get that file? I think the VA, I know this issue's been raised. I think there will be litigation. I think we'll work it out. But right now, they're making decision based on documents that the attorney cannot see. So, one of those problems that you're going to have to uh, get out there and work with. And you, when we give you a case, and Angela will make sure that all this gets done, and I frankly, 
I give this feel to private attorneys who do worry us from time to time, and I don't have the slightest worry about the folks doing the job here at, at this clinic. First thing you do is you contact your client. Now, I think a lot of folks have this thing that they're going to get somebody who's badly wounded, somebody who's John Wayne, Audie, does anybody know who Audie Murphy is? Okay. Uh, most decorated uh, combat soldier in World War II. Um, you, you're not going to get a lot of folks like that. You're going to get the guy who maybe didn't realize about the PTSD until he got home. You're going to get the, the widow whose uh, husband died at the age of 85 and, and there's some problems going back to World War II. Um, you're going to get some thoroughly decent, wonderful human beings. There will be memory problems. I had a case, the gentleman was absolutely certain that he had been wounded at the Battle of the Bulge. We reviewed his records. He gave us the proper commanding officer of his company of combat engineers. And every single document that I saw showed that he had been getting dental work done at Fort Hood with his company during the Battle of the Bulge. They then went back to, they went, his company went to Europe about three months after the, that battle. But he was just adamantly, you know, he's yelling at me on the phone and I'm just sitting there listening as I do a lot. And, you know, you go, I can't help you because that's just not the reality of it is, what the reality is. Um, we still were able to help him with his claim but not for that particular injury. So sometimes you have to deal with the reality and try to do the best you can. Other times, hey, you put on the body armor and you go looking for a VA lawyer. So uh, call your mentor. We provide mentors. These are folks who've been practicing uh, law, veterans law for eight to 12 years. Uh, they are very good, they are enthusiastic, and, and they bring a great deal of knowledge to the field. So, uh, I've already told Angela a couple of times, you know, they're there to help, they're, they're, they're great folks. Uh, read the rules of practice and e-filing rules. We have e-filing, that has been an adventure as for a whole lot of folks. Uh, read through the screening memo. My folks provide a screening memo before we assign the case. It's a road map. It is not the, the complete roadmap. You know, you have the one, the maps, like you get over at the airport and a bunch of big red lines and not much else. We ask that you do the little side roads, that you go down paths and, and with the people who can help and assist and do this, uh, this review, um, we, get some, we get some great work uh, from, from the clinics that we, other clinics that we deal with. And I have no doubt that we'll get the same from the folks here at Mizzou. Uh, file your appearance. Because once you, once you file the appearance, I don't have to worry about that case anymore. Angela's got to worry about the case. We do. I mean, to, to be honest about it, we continue to, to, tra to, to track the case. We continue to provide advice anytime that we can or ask. And uh, uh, we enjoy working with folks. Ethics, like I said, just keep your client informed. Uh, and I think this applies to anybody, anytime, anywhere. But the problem with VA law and the clients is, A, the folks are anxious, particularly the older folks. Um, and there are great periods, as, as has already been talked about, where nothing happens. First thing that happens out of the block is, you file your notice of appeal and the VA issues a docketing order which says, VA, you have 60 days to file the record before the agency, which is basically a copy of the claim file. That means for 60 days, nothing happens because the VA is very consistent in filing the record before the agency on day 58 or day 59. Um, so this is still in our bailiwick. At our time, we're sending out a postcard. Once it gets the cases assigned, you're going to have some down periods. You're going to have a period while the VA is writing their brief. You've got to write your brief, and the clients, they get anxious. Resources are there for you. That's what this is all about. 
and I know that this group is going to provide some outstanding uh, representation. Fee agreements, 20% standard, Equal Access to Justice Act is uh, it's a nice thing. Uh, if you get a case through us, you're entirely welcome to pick up a few bucks. It's some more filing work, but uh, we're good with that. Um, the one thing is you have to explain to the clients that the EJA fee does not come out of their award. It's an entirely different pot of money. And, uh, you know, we had a case. The, it was about a two month, it was one of these things that we did the right thing. The case was valued at about, uh, about $1,100. The EJA fees totaled about $4,000. Government efficiency at its best. I, I told a guy, take a, have a bake sale, just give the lady her money and, you know, go, oh, this is silly. They didn't listen to me. Uh, but, um, so the lady calls me up and says, this attorney is getting $4,000 and I only got 1100 <laughs> Doesn't seem right. Well, EJA being EJA, that happens from time to time. I want to thank all the veterans here for serving. I want to thank Angela for standing this up. This is going to be an exciting, exciting thing to, for us to be working together. Uh, we've already talked about three or four other projects, offshoots from this one. And uh, I want to thank all of you for your, your kind attention and your, your being here this afternoon. And uh, go Cardinals. <laughs>
So we'd like to take this moment to present him with the Tiger Trooper Award on behalf of the Veterans Society. <laughs> So then from that point forward, we uh, moved out the idea, the society became established, we went to some competitions, and met some people in the veterans field, uh, and then uh, sat down to the lunch that Scott described. And starting from that lunch forward, our uh, wonderful new Dean, Dean Myers, uh, has been a champion for this clinic and uh, is one of the biggest reasons why it's happening now. So we'd like to present him with the Tiger Patriot Award on behalf of the Veterans Society. And then finally, I would also like to thank the other uh, faculty member, uh, Professor Angela Drake. She's been a tireless advocate for this clinic, worked behind the scenes, uh, largely in thankless capacities, and uh, will be teaching our, our clinic, and has just been a staunch advocate. So if you'd all rise, I'd like to give up. Senator Blunt, he um, asked that I come here in his place and present a letter um, to the professors here. Uh, congratulations, everybody. Um, Dear Dean Myers, congratulations to the University of Missouri School of Law for opening the Veterans Clinic. Your commitment to providing legal services to veterans and their families is a win-win for your students and mid-Missouri veterans. The University of Missouri School of Law's Veteran Clinic will provide students with experience helping their communities with many invaluable practical legal skills that will serve them well in future endeavors. The School of Law's outstanding faculty, the guidance they will provide their students, and the help they'll give our veterans will make the Veterans Clinic a worthwhile resource for years to come. Again, congratulations and my very best wishes for your continued service. Sincere regards, Roy Blunt, United States Senator. You know, around here this week, there have been a lot of people talking about how Ted Cruz went to Harvard, Harvard Law School. Well, I went to the University of Missouri Law School in Columbia, and I couldn't be prouder of my education. I am so proud that my law school is stepping up to the plate to help out in this really important area. I'm excited for this chance because I want you all to know that you are taking this critical, critical task on in a way that is really going to help Missouri's veterans. In Missouri, we have a proud tradition of service to our country. We have so many members of the military that are from Missouri. My dad was a World War II veteran. And today, a half a century later, we have many veterans returning home who really need your help. There are so many benefits available to veterans now. All great things. The problem is they, there are so many of them, and they're located so many different places that many veterans don't even know what they're entitled to. And if they do know, they're confused about where to go to get that benefit. So the fact that these benefits are completely mired in a Byzantine bureaucracy makes it really difficult for them to navigate this complicated area. That's where you come in. They don't know where to turn, and now they can turn to you. Sometimes it's not any more complicated than just pointing out what's available. And sometimes it's going to take your sustained advocacy and shaking loose a benefit that's been stuck in the mud. 
Missouri's heroes are really lucky to have you working on their side. Best of luck. Thank you for the work you do and for the commitment to your state and to these great people who have kept us all safe. God bless. Hi, I'm Congresswoman Vicki Hartzler, and I wanted to congratulate you on opening the new Veterans Clinic. When I first heard that you were opening this clinic, I was so excited because having the opportunity to represent Whiteman Air Force Base and Fort Leonard Wood and having many, many veterans in my district, I know that you are going to make a huge difference here. And so I want to commend, first of all, Larry Lambert and Scott Epking for coming up with this idea. Uh, it's wonderful, first of all, that you are veterans. I want to thank you for your service to our country, and thank you for your continuing service to our country by proposing this idea to the University of Missouri and to Dean Gary Myers and thank you for supporting this idea and moving forward with it. You know, in our office, we have the opportunity to work with many veterans. And sadly, due to the administrative bureaucracy here, uh, many of their claims are delayed. And this is uh, can mean literally life or death to many of these veterans. Uh, they need the help. And uh, we are able, to, through my office, to help some, but we can't do the legal work that you can do. And what you're going to do is going to make a difference for people. Uh, I'm very excited to see what comes out of this and to hear the rewarding stories that you will be able to share about this. I know that in Detroit, uh, Project Salute has been able to recover over $2.6 million worth of claims for veterans, including one for $700,000, uh, with many claims being uh, thirty to 40000 dollars which will make a tremendous difference for these individuals. You know, um, there's a lot of reasons to become a, an attorney in this country, but one of them certainly is to make a difference for people and to speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. That's what you're going to do. It's going to make a, a tremendous difference, and I commend you for your efforts. I stand ready to assist and help you and support you in any way that you need and uh, look forward to hearing the tremendous successes that come from this program. So once again, congratulations and go get them. We're really done now, sorry. <laughs> there is a reception at 204 for anybody who'd like to come. Thank you very much.